It's time for our next question. Uh, listen. Hey, Mr. D'Souza. My question is, what was it like being an intern for Reagan, and what special memories do you have of him? Hmm. The um. So in the Reagan White House, I was actually very lucky to, at a young age,、uh, come in as a domestic policy、uh, analyst. So I wasn't really an intern, and and I only say this because, of course, interns have no access to the president. You have to be on staff, and you have to be at least at the middle level. I wasn't at the top level, and so my in- direct interactions with Reagan were modest. Uh, only a, a few times did I get to stand in the back of the room along with other staffers. We had our notepads in those days, and the senior staff was right around the table. People like Pat Buchanan or Ed Meese,、um, and、uh, later the chief of staff was Howard Baker. And the senior staff would interact with Reagan, but the rest of us got to stand in the back of the room and observe and take notes. And、um, and then afterward, offer comment to our own teams. In my case, the domestic policy team. So it was a thrill for me because I was in my mid twenties. I think I was. I joined the Reagan White House in 1987. So this was in the latter part, the second term of Reagan. Of course, during the first term of Reagan, I was in college. Um, but um, and I had this big palatial office in the old executive office building. I mean, an absolutely giant office with a bar. And、um, but but the real power, by the way, is not in the old executive office building. It's in the West Wing, where the offices are much smaller. But you're literally within earshot of the president, so you have more direct access to him that way. Now, with regard to Reagan,、um, Reagan was a larger than life figure. And、uh, in that sense, similar to Trump, if, if, if Reagan walked in the room, all the heads turned. It's Reagan, and I think also because of Reagan's um, um, experience as an actor, he was very aware of a room. He had a very great, a good sense of of how he moved in space, how he was perceived, and so you rarely find bad photos of Reagan where you know Reagan is like. Scratching his head, or looking extremely、uh, baffled, or confused, or at least squinting his eyes—none of that.、Um, to、uh, to watch Reagan, I noticed that he he had this ability to keep his his eye on the big picture, and、uh, he allowed his aides to have knockdown, dragout debates with each other. He didn't mind that. It wasn't a case where Reagan had a party line and everybody had to echo it. No, whether it was defense, whether it was taxes, whether it was、um, affirmative action,、uh, I would see these different、um, departments—the Justice Department and so on—all vying for influence and also having sometimes competing views of a an issue. And Reagan would sort of take it in, and generally say very little. And at the beginning, I used to think, "Wow, why doesn't Reagan participate in the debate?" And then I realized why. If a, if a leader jumps in early on and lets you know what they think, everybody else is going to sort of modify their views in line with what they just heard from the boss. So Reagan's view was, "I'm not going to tell you what I think. I actually want you to tell me what you think and argue it out、uh, and put it into the kind of battleground of of, of discussion here." And at the end. Of it, I'm going to make a kind of assessment and lay out a position because I ultimately want even the people who disagreed with me、uh, to come on board, recognizing that I have done them the due diligence of hearing them out and seeing their opinions emerge through the crucible of of argument. Um, Reagan, however, did not have sort of a deep patience with listening to a debate for like hours and hours. In fact, when things started dragging on and were not being resolved, I sometimes noticed that Reagan would like tune the whole thing out. He would just not be paying attention. It's almost like he got the gist, he got the picture, and so here was a guy who had a kind of sense of priorities. I would put it somewhat this way: <coughs> Reagan knew that. He couldn't change the world in you know forty different ways. He was not a micromanager in the Jimmy Carter sense. Reagan's view was that that the reason you have teams and the White House is is、uh, the, the the kind of、uh, the the tip of the pyramid of a very large pyramid. And Reagan's view is: I need competent people across、uh, the different areas of government to carry out tasks, and they need to be given general direction, not specific direction. 
At one point, I remember there was a Marine who had come in. Uh, this was before the invasion of Grenada. Now, I was not in the White House at this time. Uh, this was before before I joined. Uh, but I got the story from someone who was there, and they said that this guy was very enthusiastically explained to Reagan, you know, Mr. President, our plan is to move in over here, and we're going to land here, and our troops are going to cut across here, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And Reagan just was sort of listening in a gener generic way, and then he tapped the Marine on the shoulder, and he said something like, son, I have full confidence in you I, and your plan. You carry it out. In other words, you go do it. You don't need to explain to me every street that your troops are going to be running up and every how they're going to take this bridge and how they're going to neutralize the opposition. I'm giving you the authority as someone who's competent and trained for this task to carry it out. And I just want you to come back and tell me the job has been done and has been done successfully. So this is, to me, I learned a lot about leadership from Reagan. A leader doesn't have to figure it all out. He has to just figure out what the direction is, find good people, and then task them or empower them to get the job done.